Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the RSA. To those of you here uh, in the great room, to the many more strewn across RSA House, and to all those many hundreds uh, watching online as well. I'm Andy Haldane. I'm the Chief Executive here at the RSA. It's my huge pleasure to welcome you all today, and also, of course, uh, today's very special guest, First Minister of Scotland, uh, Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, the First Minister, of course, uh, needs absolutely no introduction from me, but she's getting one nonetheless, um, <laughs> albeit a fairly brief one, um, so we have plenty of time uh, for what should be a fascinating conversation. Uh, the First Minister joined uh, the SNP at age 16, I think. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. <laughs> And after a brief excursion uh, into the law, which is politics, becoming first a deputy leader uh, and deputy first minister of Scotland in 2007, and then, of course, leader and um, first minister uh, in 2014. And that means the first minister is not only uh, Scotland's first female and longest serving leader, but is also widely acknowledged uh, as among the most significant and accomplished uh, politicians of the 21st century. We're delighted to welcome the First Minister of the RSA today for what's her final public lecture uh, as leader of the SNP and as First Minister of Scotland. And what better place to do it than this, here in the great room uh, of the RSA, that's been witnessing leading uh, politicians, and public thinkers and innovators and change makers for over 260 years. The First Minister will first give her speech, reflecting on her time in office and her hopes for the future, including the themes uh, of climate uh, and of inequality, both of which very strongly aligned, of course, with her interests here at the RSA. I'm also proud to say we've worked closely with the Scottish Government over the past several years on both those issues and many more besides. We'll then go quickly into a conversation with some easy questions from me before we go to you uh, in the audience for your questions, probably a bit less easy. Uh, for those joining online via our live stream, you can post your questions in the chat and across social media using the hashtag, hashtag RSA First Minister. Look forward to those. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the RSA, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturge. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Andy, for that kind introduction. And thank you for the invitation to be here with you today. It's a, a real pleasure and privilege to be here in these beautiful and extremely significant surroundings. For me, this is very much a week of final acts. Uh, tomorrow, I will chair my final meeting of the Scottish Cabinet. Uh, on Thursday, I'll answer my final set of First Minister's questions. I have to say I'm not too devastated about uh, that. <laughs> and this speech is the last I will make in London as First Minister. And it is a real pleasure to deliver it here at the RSA. It's a pleasure to be here for many reasons, but one of those reasons is that, as some of you may know, this building and this room were designed by the Scottish architect, Robert Adam. And of course, he also designed Butte House, the First Minister's official residence in Edinburgh. So this is possibly the closest I get to a home from home here in London. Now, almost inevitably, given my imminent, very imminent uh, now departure from government, in thinking about this speech, I've been looking back. Uh, my last visit here to the RSA was in late 2018, uh, almost halfway through my time as First Minister. And of course, back then, the UK was at the midpoint of the Brexit process, or should I say the midpoint of the Brexit process so far, as I'm not sure <laughs> it is yet complete. And I had come to London that day, uh, in addition, of course, to speaking here at the RSA, to talk about the Chequers Agreement. Does anybody still remember <laughs> the Chequers Agreement? 
And I was also here in an attempt, turned out to be an unsuccessful, completely vain attempt, to persuade the UK government to opt for single market and customs union membership as part of a compromise approach to Brexit. Today, I'm going to be a bit more reflective, uh, although it's less than four and a half years since I gave that speech here in 2018. I don't think there's any doubt that for me, and I'm sure for all of us, it feels much, much longer than that. Uh, we have, uh, of course, seen since then the UK leave the European Union. We have lived through a global pandemic, the biggest single crisis the UK has faced in the post-war period, and certainly the most difficult and challenging experience of my time as First Minister. Uh, Russia has provoked war in Europe on a scale that all of us fervently hoped we would never ever see again. And the impact of the climate and nature crises are becoming, is becoming more evident and of course ever more urgent. Indeed, I, I think there's a, a strong case, perhaps an, an arguable case for saying that the past eight and a half years have been the most volatile and eventful in the UK's post-war history. I mean, just to illustrate that in, in perhaps a, a slightly, although not entirely, uh, light-hearted way, in the just over quarter of a century between me leaving primary school and becoming Deputy First Minister of Scotland, the UK had just three Prime Ministers. In the eight and a half years of my time as First Minister, it's had five Prime Ministers. The sheer extent of that volatility, uh, certainly for the purposes of today, presents me with something of a dilemma in contemplating a retrospective of my time in office. It means I can't possibly cover all of the various twists and turns, and you'll be very glad to know I'm not even going to attempt to do that. Instead, I, I want to reflect on three issues in particular, issues that have uh, very often been uppermost in my mind uh, during my years in office, issues and certainly the, uh, the two issues of substance that I'm going to talk about have mattered a great deal to me uh, during my time as First Minister. But all of these are issues that I believe will continue to shape politics, not just in Scotland, but far more widely in the years to come. I'll reflect on two very closely interlinked issues addressing inequality and tackling climate change. They've been central to my ambitions as First Minister, and I want to talk about what I consider to be their vital importance to our social and political future. But before I, I do that, I want to touch on a topic that is not so much about what we do as politicians, but how we do it. I want to make some observations on the nature of our political and public discourse. Because I, and this is based on many years now of experience, I increasingly feel and fear indeed that the nature of our discourse, not just as politicians, but as a society, is undermining our ability, and not just in Scotland or even the UK, but in much of the democratic world, to address the big issues of substance that will shape our futures. Now, as an aside, I should probably acknowledge that talking about the state of political discourse might seem like a brave topic for me right now, given that my own party is in the midst of, uh, how will I describe it, a somewhat fractious uh, leadership election. But in fact, that actually helps to illustrate my point. I would hope it is obvious, given that I have chosen to stand down as leader of my party and first minister of my country, that I, I do think this is a moment, certainly for my party after 16 years in government, to change, refresh and renew. But the circumstances in which we are doing that are a bit unusual. Normally, political parties go through a process like this after an election defeat, after they've been given their marching orders by the public. And that's not the situation the SNP is in. We actually haven't lost an election in Scotland since 2010. In fact, in my eight years as leader, we've won no fewer than eight landslide election victories. So we are electing a new leader from a position of electoral strength. And actually, in some ways, perhaps counterintuitively, that makes the task a bit harder. Because striking the balance between change on the one hand and protecting the essential ingredients of our success on the other 
is quite tricky. We need to take care not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And all of that calls for a balanced and nuanced debate. And yet the nature of modern media, social media in particular, can make that more difficult than it should be. Now, of course, that is by no means the only factor at play in the SNP contest. And I should say, while it might not feel like it right now, I am firmly of the view that my party will emerge from this process in a strong position. The point I'm making, though, is a wider one. And it is a, a wider point about democracy. Social media has many benefits. It has helped democratise political discourse and access to information. It brings together people who, for reasons of geography, age, experience, would never previously have been able to connect. It enables politicians to communicate with the public more quickly and in a more direct and unfiltered way. But right now it feels that the damage social media is doing globally to public discourse and to democracies is outweighing the benefits of it. Now, I haven't always, uh, or even to be frank, often in my political career agreed with Tony Blair, uh, but I did recently hear him express the view that social media is a plague on politics. And while I don't agree that this is an inevitability, I do think it is the reality right now. It is distorting debate. The sheer pace of rolling news encourages us to speak first and think later. Minor dramas become crises and then catastrophes in what can often feel like nanoseconds. Algorithms create echo chambers. They obliterate nuance and force us into binary positions that polarise even, sometimes especially, the most complex of issues. The distinction between objective fact and subjective opinion has all but disappeared. Absolutely everything is contested, which makes finding common ground much, much harder. And all of this is undermining rational decision making. Decision makers are under enormous pressure to take positions and respond to events at breakneck speed with next to no time to weigh up complexities or uncertainties. The amplification effect of social media too often leads politicians to think that quite extreme positions are the view of the majority when they are most definitely not. And then, of course, there is the abuse that is hurled at anyone who puts their head above the parapet. You know, politics has always been tough, and I'm a great believer that it should be tough. But social media is creating an environment that, frankly, is harsher and more hostile, particularly for women and those from minority communities, than at any time in my political career. It gives racism, misogyny, sexism, bigotry generally, none of these new phenomena by any means, a platform and a vehicle. And if we're not careful, it will drive the kind of people we desperately need to see more of in politics and public life even further away. Now, to be clear, I don't know we can't turn the clock back. I'm not naive about that. Social media in one form or another is here to stay and no doubt it will go on changing and changing rapidly. But I am firmly of the view that if it continues to dominate and shape or rather misshape debate in the way that it does now, if we continue to allow the negatives to outweigh the positives, we do risk destroying our ability to address the massive era-defining issues that the world currently faces. So we must, and this is a personal view, uh, but one I hold very strongly, we must, as a matter of urgency, rediscover and recharge one of the basic functions of democracy to peaceably and civilly resolve our differences. You know, I'm often struck uh, back at home on the issue of Scottish independence uh, by how often I hear people say we shouldn't debate it at all because it is divisive. I couldn't disagree more with that view and not just on the question of independence. We cannot shy away from legitimate political, economic, social or constitutional issues because they divide opinion or involve hard choices. Instead, for the sake of democracy, we must find ways of debating and resolving these issues with respect, reason, civility and good faith. Indeed, in my view, and this is based on many years now of experience, 
This probably is one of the most pressing issues confronting democracies everywhere. And the reason is simple. Unless we improve the quality of our debate, discourse and decision making and underpin it with reason and a degree of social cohesion, we will be increasingly incapable of finding the solutions to the massive economic, social, environmental challenges we face. And we will certainly not be able to do so with anything like the consensus needed for implementing some of these solutions. And that is certainly true of the two issues I want to touch on today, inequality and climate change. You know, these are without doubt amongst the biggest issues we face globally today, and they are inextricably linked. You know, to put it bluntly, those who struggle to heat their homes or feed their families now will be less able to make the changes needed to save the planet in the future. And of course, they will also often be the people most severely affected by the impacts of climate change. And unless we put fairness firmly at the heart of our efforts to combat climate change, we will deepen inequality, not the reverse. The need to tackle both these challenges head on and in tandem has never been clearer. Scotland has much to do on both, but we are seeking to lead by example. Uh, during COVID, it was clear, I think to all of us, that while we were all living through the pandemic, our experiences were not all the same. Those experiences differed depending on the jobs we did, the degree of financial security we enjoyed, and the type of home we lived in. Those on lower incomes or from minority communities were more likely to become seriously ill or die as a result of COVID. And it quickly became very clear just how much as individuals and collectively as society, we depended, depend today on those who work in relatively low paid and undervalued sectors like social care, essential retail and, and delivery services. And that led not just here in the UK, but across much of the world to a desire and a demand from the public that we build back better after the pandemic. And in Scotland, again, much to do, but we are trying to do that. Since the pandemic, we have redoubled our efforts to tackle poverty, especially child poverty, and better support those on low incomes. It's no accident that we have the highest proportion of workers of any UK nation paid the real living wage. We have, uh, by choice, a more progressive system of income tax. Uh, while the majority of taxpayers in Scotland pay slightly less tax than counterparts elsewhere in the UK, we ask those who earn the most to pay a bit more tax, both to help fund public services and tackle poverty. Uh, and we've given lie to the notion uh, in recent years that politicians in the modern day can ask people to pay more tax and go on to win elections. We've proven uh, that that is not the case. The Scottish child payment is unique across these islands. It takes the form of a payment of £25 per week per child for low-income families. And a recent report by the Institute for Fiscal Studies found that the poorest families with children in Scotland are now £2,000 per year better off as a result of that collection of policies. It is redistribution in action. And for some families over this winter in particular, it will have made the difference between having food on the table or not. We've also taken a different approach to public sector pay, choosing negotiation over confrontation. That hasn't it meant that we've escaped difficult industrial action in some parts of the public service. Uh, but we are the only UK nation to have avoided any strikes at all in the National Health Service. And on average, our public sector workers are paid more than in the rest of the UK, helping to tackle low pay. And to those, and there are uh, many who say that our approach to tackling inequality damages economic competitiveness, the evidence actually suggests otherwise. Now, obviously, the UK, including Scotland, right now is facing sluggish economic growth and many economic challenges, none of them helped, of course, by Brexit. But right now, Scotland has higher employment, lower unemployment and lower economic inactivity than the UK as a whole. And we remain the most attractive part of the UK outside of London uh, for foreign direct investment. 
A focus on tackling inequality, in my view, has always been important, fundamentally important. I've argued for a very long time that it should be the aim of governments everywhere to improve and measure the well-being of populations, not simply to measure economic growth. Because there is a wealth of evidence that economic prosperity and social justice are mutually reinforcing. But if I believed that for a long time, I believe uh, ever more strongly now that addressing inequality is urgent as we accelerate our efforts to tackle the climate crisis. The synthesis report that has just been published in the last couple of hours by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, underlines again the need for that acceleration. The transition to net zero is not easy, uh, far from it. But as well as being absolutely existentially necessary, it also offers us significant economic opportunities. But to take advantage of those opportunities, we need more inclusive and targeted industrial policies that encourage public and private collaboration for the common good. And we also need the benefits of economic activity to be shared much more equitably. That reality is reflected strongly in President Biden's industrial policy in the form of the Inflation Reduction and Chips Act in the United States. The EU is starting to reflect it too. And while the UK is, in my view, lagging behind, risking further economic damage as a result, in Scotland we are working hard to get this right. Our major offshore wind programme, Scotwind, is the leading example of that. It has the potential to generate up to 28 gigawatts of wind power in years to come and also to support a significant green hydrogen industry as well. And as a result of conditionalities applied in the process of awarding the seabed leases, Scotwind could also deliver up to £28 billion of supply chain work in Scotland. Now that will help create quality jobs and also help us support a just transition from oil and gas to renewable energies. Having said all that, again, I need to be really clear. We have much, much more to do. We've not got this cracked yet. Uh, Mariana Mazzucato, who spoke here last month with uh, Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados, is one of those advising us on how we maximise that approach. And that approach is vital because the transition to net zero, like any economic disruption, does create a significant risk that some people and some communities get left badly behind. And for me, there's a, a strong lesson from uh, my own upbringing and from Scotland's relatively recent history that we absolutely must learn. I grew up in Ayrshire in the west of Scotland in the 1970s and 80s. And it was my experiences back then in many ways uh, that shaped the political beliefs I hold today. I often say it was Margaret Thatcher that motivated me into politics. I don't mean it quite as it sounds. It's because I opposed everything she stood for. Uh, but that is uh, a digression. Uh, but the part of Scotland that I grew up in was deeply scarred by the closure of coal mines and heavy industries. And it wasn't the only part of Scotland. Uh, and some of these communities still bear those scars today, all these decades later. And that was because a process of deindustrialization was allowed to unfold without any effort to mitigate or manage the consequences. And that weighs heavily on me as we accelerate now the process of decarbonisation. That's why, for example, the Scottish Government set up a Just Transition Commission back in 2019. It's why we have established a Just Transition Fund for the northeast of Scotland, where the oil and gas sector is currently a major employer. And we've been doing uh, some very interesting work with this institution, uh, work that involves consulting closely with people in an old industrial town, Leaven in Fife, and also in Dumfries, a more rural community, to explore their hopes, priorities, and concerns about the move to net zero. That's a relatively small project, but it is helping inform our work in quite an important way. And it helps demonstrate, I think, how these twin challenges of inequality and climate come together. The reimagining of our way of life, for example, reducing our reliance on cars and changing how we heat our homes, changes that are necessary to reduce our impact on the planet, also give us 
a unique opportunity to tackle deep-seated inequalities. If we are building new infrastructure, as we must do, and redesigning our energy systems and creating new growth opportunities, we can do that from the outset with fairness as the underlying principle. We can design transport systems better suited to the needs of the lower paid, of women and of those, like almost half the households in my home city of Glasgow, who do not own cars. We can install heating systems in social housing that are cheaper to run, helping us meet our climate goals and eliminate fuel poverty. New industries can start out with a commitment to gender equality embedded instead of trying to retrofit it afterwards. Now, I know in a speech like this, it's easy to make this all sound relatively simple. I don't mean to because it is anything but simple. Equally, though, we mustn't tell ourselves it is too difficult to try and too difficult to achieve. We have a precious opportunity in the years ahead to address multiple challenges in a genuinely joined up way. And these are the necessary tasks. Yes, they are on a grand scale, but they are necessary, uh, the tasks that lie ahead of current and future leaders. In Scotland, the groundwork is being laid with the right investment, commitment and drive. I truly believe we have a unique opportunity to deliver a fair and a just climate transition. And we can also use this moment, this opportunity, to tackle the poverty and inequality that has seemed so entrenched for far too long. And of course, that principle applies internationally as well as within nations. Indeed, that's why when Glasgow played host to the COP26 climate conference in 2021, the Scottish Government conducted a series of dialogues with the Global South. And that led us, amongst other things, to become the first developed country in the world to commit funding to climate loss and damage. We recognise that the Global North needs to do much, much more, not just to help countries mitigate or adapt to climate change, but also to address the loss and damage that many are facing already as a result of it. Scotland, of course, is a small country, so our commitments on loss and damage are small compared to the scale of the challenge. But by listening to the Global South and by acting, I hope we've helped build bridges that could, if the world follows that lead, help avoid a deepening of the global divide. There is no doubt at all that the importance of a just transition internationally and within nation states will become even greater in the years to come. Now, the point I want to return to and conclude on is that the issues I've covered today equality and the climate crisis and the nature of our political civic debate are in some respects very distinct, but they are also deeply connected. An argument that weighs uh, more heavily on me now than it did eight years ago at the outset of my leadership is that promoting fairness, achieving greater equality in our societies is absolutely essential to preserving faith in politics and in democratic institutions. The sense that people have been ignored and disregarded by their governments has no doubt fueled the wave of populism that has gripped parts of the developed world, including the UK and the United States. Brexit, of course, is an example of that. And I do not uh, believe I uh, am not of the view that my country, Scotland, is immune to that in any way. It's deepened the polarization of debate that I mentioned earlier, which in turn makes it so much harder to have a genuine dialogue about difficult and contentious issues. We need to break out of that cycle. It won't be easy, but we desperately need to break out of that cycle. And in my view, we can. I mentioned earlier on that leading Scotland through the pandemic was by far, uh, by, by far, the toughest challenge of my time as First Minister. I fervently hope it's the toughest thing I'll ever do uh, in my life. But that experience also taught me, uh, as I did uh, daily press conferences uh, for months and months and months on end, that the public is much more than capable, is more than capable when treated like grown-ups of understanding and accepting complexity, uncertainty and nuance. The pandemic also showed us how much we can achieve when we face huge challenges with common purpose. You know, businesses adapted ways of working in days, testing infrastructure was set up almost from scratch, vaccines developed 
from a standing start. People came together, albeit virtually, to care for and help each other. So we did get an insight into exactly what governments, businesses and societies can do when united behind a common goal and shared imperatives. Now, of course, the climate crisis works over a longer time scale than the pandemic and inequality in our society has been ingrained for generations. That makes it harder, much harder, to summon and sustain similar energy and urgency in dealing with these challenges. But if we can bring even some of that to bear, and if we are prepared to be honest about the challenges, the trade-offs and the difficulties, if we treat each other with respect and if we are open about the uncertainties we all face, then perhaps we can, as governments across the world, bring people with us even as we are forced to make tough decisions. So as I prepare to demit office in uh, just seven days' time now, if I do have any words of so-called wisdom, I feel the need to insert the so-called there, uh, so-called wisdom to offer, not just to my successor, but to leaders everywhere, advice that is drawn, let me be very clear, from my weaknesses as well as my strengths, from my failures as well as my successes, it would be uh, these words. Don't shy away from uncertainties, doubts and complexities. Embrace them, explain them and ask those you serve uh, to do so too. And be as bold as you can be, especially on the issues that matter most. Governments everywhere must prioritise the issues to take on. No government can be bold on absolutely everything. But when I look back at the achievements I am proudest of, reforming the income tax system, setting up the Scottish Child Payment, establishing a national investment bank with a net zero mission, and in a country shaped by oil and gas for half a century, setting the pace on the transition to renewables, they all involved taking steps that were difficult, controversial, but vital. None of that guarantees electoral success, although it's my belief and my experience that it will increase the chances of it. But much, much more importantly than that, it will increase your chances as a leader of making a positive difference to politics and to the people you serve. And as the leaders who come after me take on these challenges, I have no doubt at all that they will benefit just as I have done from the vital work of institutions like the RSA. Uh, I am sure that this institution will continue to support, inform and challenge, on occasion inspire the next generation of politicians as we try to create a better politics, a better society and hopefully a better world. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you, Nicola, for that absolute tour de force. And perhaps I can kick off the, the questions and ask you to cast your mind back, I think it's just over 10 years, actually, to your 16-year-old self, um, and ask what advice you'd have given your 16-year-old self now, given what you know and given where politics are, what you've told yourself. Don't take yourself so seriously is probably at the top <laughs> of that list, but... I, I often say this and people kind of look at me askance because I'm a politician that delivers speeches and goes on television, but I, I was a very shy, reserved child, teenager, adult now. I'm, I'm an introvert at heart. And I think in my political career, I've had to overcome that every day to do what I do. Um, and I think the process that I had to go through in my younger days definitely led me to to take myself too seriously because I felt always, always had to go the extra mile to prove myself, to prove that I was good enough and up to uh, what I was, I was seeking to do. And I wouldn't tell my younger self to change that completely. I've talked as lots of women, some men do over the years about imposter syndrome. And I've come to the conclusion that in some ways that need to overcome self-doubt, you know, a degree of shyness and introversion it's a bit of a secret superpower because it does make you work harder and rise more to the challenges. But I think I would tell my younger self to remember to have a bit of fun, not to be all work and no play and, to, and not to take myself too seriously because it is um, only now at the age of, 
before I find myself every time I say this, at the age of almost 53, standing down from a lifetime in frontline politics that I'm hoping to have some more fun in life. So there you go. <laughs> Don't leave it till you're 53 to have fun is what I wish I told my 16-year-old self. <laughs> on, um, it's about two weeks ago we had, um, on the stage actually, she was sat there, I was sat here, uh, Alexandra Matvichuk, who's the Ukrainian civil rights um, lawyer, um, winner of last year's Nobel Peace Prize. And she was talking um, about democracy, uh, its importance, very much the same themes as you mentioned at the start, the start of your speech. And she said, too many people right now are happy to be consumers of democracy and need to become producers of democracy. Mm -hmm. We need more people involved actively in politics. And I just wondered your reflections on how we make politics more accessible, more appealing, to make us all producers and not consumers. I'm not sure we could all be producers. I think there's always got to be a mix. But I would like to see not just more people being producers of democracy, but the, the people who are the producers being more diverse and coming from different backgrounds uh, more women, more people from minority communities, more people from working class backgrounds um, and younger people uh, coming through into politics. And in, in many ways, politics is much more accessible than it was when I was starting out, uh, partly because of some of the advantages of the modern world and the ways we communicate with each other. It is easier to connect and to, to share ideas and to access information. But in other ways, as I reflected there, you know, it is a much, much more hostile environment than at any time in my, my career. So how do we get over that? We need to rediscover how to be opponents without being enemies, how to disagree passionately, but remember that just because you disagree with somebody passionately on one thing doesn't mean that you can't agree with them on other things. You, you look at social media right now and people who disagree on one thing just become you know, as if they... They are aliens to each other and can't possibly have any common ground. So we need to encourage younger people uh, from all walks of life, from all backgrounds, to see politics as a force for good, of a way of making a difference and making change and you know, keeping an open mind as you go through that journey and, and, and through your life. I, I always choose, I think, in life, and particularly with the state of the world in some respects now, it is too easy to, to descend into pessimism. Um, I choose, and I think we should all choose to be optimistic, but we don't get that better world by accident. We have to fight for it and campaign for it and push for it and progress, as we're finding out on many issues in many parts of the world. You can never take progress for granted. It can go backwards as well as forwards, and it's rarely linear. So I think we just have to inspire people to see politics, democracy, governance as a way of delivering positive change, but it's tough. And on that theme of, of young people in particular, I mean, one theme that stirs the soul of young people is climate right now. Mm. You mentioned climate as being one of, if not the signature issues of our time. And I wondered, Nicola, are we winning that battle? Right now, no. Um, and that's, that's deeply depressing. Um, I think it's not too late to turn that around and, and to, to start to win it. But if we stay on the trajectory we are on right now globally, then climate change is going to overwhelm and overpower. It's going to, it's going to win. Um, and that's why there needs to be a much greater sense of urgency. And go back to your first question. I think we've also got to be, and those of us who've been in politics a long time have a role to play here to assist those who are you know, coming on after us. We've got to be prepared to take on vested interests, people for whom uh, it suits for the world to stay as it is. And, you know, I, I, as I refer to there, Scotland's a country that for all of my lifetime has benefited from fossil fuels, from oil and gas. There's, you know, 100,000 jobs directly and indirectly in Scotland dependent on oil and gas. So it's a difficult thing to say to people, we've got to accelerate the move away from that. But we are letting down this and future generations if we shy away from it. So we've got to take on established ways of, of thinking. You know, one of the things that's often said about me in Scotland is that I, you know, I'm, I'm anti-business. I'm not anti-business. I just don't think businesses exist in a vacuum. I don't think they are outside society. They're part of it. How businesses conduct themselves, how, you know, they value their workers, what they pay their workers, determines the kind of society we have. They benefit from 
investment in infrastructure and education. We're all in this together. It sounds a bit trite and cliched, but it's true. And we need to find those common bonds that allow us to take on the common challenges. But if we don't get our act together quickly, the IPCC report out today, which I've just had a chance to, to scan over, is another very, very loud wake-up call. And we've got to start taking it much more seriously. Our future generations will never, ever forgive us, and rightly so. I'm going to the audience in a, uh, in a second. One last question from me. Um, this is an Enlightenment institution. And for me, at the very core of the Scottish Enlightenment was this notion that in building a better society, we need to fuse together the combined might of the public sector government, yeah. of the private sector business, and of civil society. And that was loud and clear from your speech as well. How do we do that? I think much of what we're doing in Scotland is showing the way. It's not perfect. We don't always get it right. We have much more to do. But I think we are, are showing the way. You know, we... You know, Adam Smith is often you know, talked about as the, you know, the, the father of capitalism. And actually, it was Adam Smith that started talking about the, you know, the common good, the need to, to marry that private uh, sector uh, activity with, with public good as well. So it's in our history, but it's there. We were one of three governments um, alongside Iceland and New Zealand, perhaps coincidentally all led by women uh, at the time, that established the, the well-being uh, group of governments to say actually how, how healthy and happy and contented your population is actually matters. Economic growth matters, of course it does, but it's not the only thing that matters. Uh, we do have very strong collaboration between the public and private sector. We don't see the public sector as, as bad and the private sector always as good. We recognise the, the de dependencies and the uh, mutuality there and we respect public service and, and public uh, sector activity, as, as we should do. So we don't have all the answers, but I think much of the work we're doing is demonstrating that kind of philosophy in action. Terrific. Adam Smith, RSA fellow, just saying. Um, <laughs> let's go to the floor and collect some uh, questions. We'll start with, uh, wait for the mic, and maybe give your name and affiliation. We'll start with, uh, I think, David down here. Uh, David Porter, BBC Scotland. Um, First Minister, welcome back to London. Um, what do you make of Mike Russell's comments that your party is in, quote, a tremendous mess? And what should this mean for the leadership campaign to succeed you? Should it be looked at again? Should it be postponed? Should you be First Minister for a bit longer? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know the BBC would never want to misquote Mike Russell. He didn't say the SNP was a mess. He said the narrative, and, and I am now paraphrasing him, so forgive me, that the narrative around the leadership uh, election had become uh, messy. Uh, I have absolute confidence in the process of electing my successor. Um, I think that process should, in fact, I think all of the candidates uh, now have said they have confidence in that uh, too. And uh, the uh, leader who succeeds me will be known... Uh, I think by this time next week, actually, and I don't know who that will be. I'm not endorsing any particular candidate. I will back whoever uh, my party chooses, and I believe they'll then lead uh, my party on to uh, even bigger and better things, and I will demit office at that point and go on to do whatever comes next for me. I'm going to go with um, Serena down here, and maybe Lewis next to um, her, and then we'll go online. Uh, Serena Bakasinga from Channel 4 News. Uh, just going back to uh, Mike Russell's comment, um, he did say the party was in a tremendous mess, and he's the interim chief exec of the SNP party. Who caused that mess? Who's to blame? You or your husband? Um, it's not what... Well, I don't want to get into backwards and forwards. I think if in, anybody can go and look at the context. The SNP... Uh, I'm about to step down from a party, and I said it in my, uh, my speech, that is undefeated electorally since, I think the last time we lost an election was the 2010 general election in Scotland. Um, and that's unusual for a party to be going through a process of a leadership election when it hasn't suffered an, an electoral defeat. It's not you know, unprecedented, but it is unusual. So there is no way of looking at it. My party is undefeated electorally. 
Uh, we remain the biggest party by far in Scotland. Uh, you know, even opinion polls taken in the course of this uh, leadership election have shown that we remain significantly ahead of, of our opposition. And that brings challenges because you always have to guard against complacency or thinking that you can, you know, sort of take your eye off the ball and, and continue to be elected. But there is no doubt the SNP is in a, a position uh, of electoral strength that other parties would love to be in. And what we've got to do now is build on that. And that's what uh, the new leader will do. Lewis Goodall from uh, the News Agents. First Minister, your three wannabe successors have, throughout this contest, either been savaging your record or their respective records in government. The chief executive of the SNP has had to resign. There are accusations from at least one of the candidates and others that uh, one of the candidates is behaving in a Trumpian manner. Accusations the process has been rigged in some way. How impressed have you been by this contest so far? And what message do you think it's sending to the people of Scotland about the SNP right now? Well, the, the people of Scotland, as they have been throughout our time in government, um, will be the, the judge and the arbiter of the SNP and whether uh, we retain their trust. And I'm, I'm confident that will be the case, but no party should take that for granted. The SNP hasn't had a leadership election in uh, almost 20 years. So we're going through a process that is, for many in the party, the first time we've ever gone through it. It's proving to be... Yeah, a challenging and, and difficult process, but it's a necessary process to uh, embrace change and make a transition. The SNP has uh, only had three leaders in the last 30 years. Three people have led the SNP for, I think, 30 years. So this is a, it's, it's, it's an unusual process for the SNP, but it's essential and it's healthy. And while it might not feel it right now, it will, I think, lead to uh, a stronger position uh, as we come out of it. What my message to, and I'm not saying this for the first time, to those uh, standing to succeed me and to my party generally, is that we've got to get that balance right between the, the change, the renewal, that any sensible party, particularly after getting close to two decades in power, will, will go through, but also not jettisoning the things that have made us successful. That coalition of supporters that we have built over many years, the the election winning campaign machine that has delivered uh, those successes. So getting that balance right is, is important. And as I said there, be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I am sure my party will pull that off. Okay, thank you. I'd like to get a couple of questions uh, online, if I may. Uh, the first is, what role, Nicola, do you see for Scotland's substantial investment community, national services sector, in supporting economic development, either in Scotland or indeed... Um, globally? Um, enormous. Well, I mean, obviously, Scotland's financial services sector is the biggest in the UK outside of this city. It employs tens of thousands of people. It contributes hugely to our uh, economic uh, activity as a country, but it has massive potential now to help us make the, the green transition. Yeah. In particular, I uh, co-chair, or at least have done until now, I will be passing this on soon, uh, our financial services advisory board that seeks to make sure we maximise the role of the sector. We recently established an investor panel, people with expertise in the investment community, to look at how Scotland positions itself uh, as strongly as possibly to attract the, the global investment that we need to help with the, the climate transition and the other economic transitions uh, that we need to make. And as I, I think I referred to in my speech, we've recently established a, a state-owned investment bank, which is mission-driven that is seeking to help pull all that together as well. So massive importance and potential. And in that same spirit, you mentioned the, the generational challenges that we face. Uh, this question asks, what do you think about the concept of a future generations commissioner or even minister? If you like, say, you're stewarding that future. Um, it's an interesting idea. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly or not, but I think Wales perhaps have something of, of that type. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it is something that perhaps has, has merit. I suppose my word, one word of caution would be that the generational challenges we face cross and, and span every element of, of government and, and governance. And I suppose with creating a, a particular commissioner or, or, or minister to be 
responsible for that, you risk actually sort of pigeonholing it and not driving the kind of cross cross government, cross sectoral reform you need. But I, I, I do think it's a, an interesting ideal. I'll, I'll, I'll maybe raise it with my successor, whoever he or she turns out to be. <laughs> Back in the room. Uh, who we'll, we'll group together two or three questions so we manage to squeeze as many in as possible. And we'll start here. I thought that was the first hand up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. Um, Donna Carmichael, born in Dundee, grew up in Canada, living in London. Uh, my question to you is that um, I think your decision to leave came as a surprise to, to most of us. And my question really is a simple one. Why and why now? And are there any kind of similar uh, reasons to Jacinta Ardern and others who, you know, have alluded to the viciousness of politics these days, the social media you talked about? So if you could answer that kind of a political and a personal uh, perspective. Yeah. I'll try and do it quickly. I, I, the day I announced my resignation, I, I think I spoke for 20 minutes or so setting it out, so I'll try not to repeat that exercise here. Um, first, first thing to say is, yeah, okay, it probably did come as a surprise to people when I made that announcement. I think it always would have done because you, you don't signal your departure from a job like this in advance. So whenever it happens, it's going to seem like a shock and a surprise. That said, some of the colleagues of uh, the journalists here have been in Scotland have been speculating for a couple of years that I was about any minute to, to step down. So uh, then they, they say it came as a surprise. There's a, a bit of a... Uh, truth is, is somewhere in the, the middle of that. Why, why now? I mean, it is a mix of personal and political. The, on the personal side, I suppose I've got to a point, and it, it's taken me quite a while to admit this to myself, that I don't know how much longer I could give it the 100% of myself that I think the job requires and, and it's, that's the only way I can do it. You know, being First Minister is, it's 24 seven. You're never off duty, even when you're nominally on holiday or having a day off, you're never off duty. You know, some of the things that people take for granted, normal life things like, you know, going out for a coffee with your friends or whatever are very difficult to do. It takes its toll on you over a long, a long period of time and that would be the case in normal times the the last few years have not been normal covid i think looking back definitely had a big impact on me physically and, and mentally so all of that just came to the point where i thought i yeah i could soldier on for a bit longer but am i giving it everything that i would want to give it and if the answer to that is no i'm better to step back and let somebody else do it there's then also that which i've already alluded to today there's just that you know midlife assessment I, I suppose that you make at this stage in life I've been in politics for all of my adult life I entered parliament at 29 I've been a minister since I was 37 I'm now as I said almost 53 you having spent all my life being the politician I want to spend a bit more time being the person and and you know developing uh, that side and then politically and this is this is, will be the final point when you have been in a position like this for as long as I have, and, and this will sound as if I'm bigging myself up, it's not meant to sound like that. You know, I've, I've dominated Scottish politics for quite some time. And just as I have talked about today in, in terms of the effect of social media, I think somebody in that dominant position for a long time starts to have the same effect on political debate. There's nobody in Scotland or very few people who don't have an opinion about me and the longer you're in office, it gets harder to change people's opinions. And what you also find is that if you are pursuing other issues on whatever it might be, people's views on those issues become very shaped by their views about you as a person or things they've agreed with you about in the past. So you yourself begin to become just a little bit of a distortion of the, the, the debate. And you know, change has to happen in every organisation, in every government, in every country. And, you know, I, I sometimes, well, I got to the conclusion that if I'd stayed longer, I would just be delaying that inevitable process of change. And I was actually doing uh, more of a service to my party and the country to step back now and allow that process to, to happen. And I think it will be a healthy one, uh, even if, as I said earlier on, it might not always feel it uh, right at the moment. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, and... In terms of parallels with people talk about Jacinda Ardern, very different. But yes, there are some echoes in what she has said with what I have said. And 
I was saying to somebody this morning, um, when she made her announcement, I hadn't reached this decision. I don't even think I was conscious of coming to this conclusion. But I vividly remember hearing her make that announcement that morning and feeling a sense of mm. envy. Interesting. And maybe that's the moment it went from my subconscious to my conscious. So yeah. I don't know if any of that makes sense. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> Can I ask you, to, picking up, as Adam was mentioned, um, the question here online, what are the characteristics of the, the positive leaders that you've come into contact with? Which ones were you most impressed with? Um, so the characteristics, uh, first of all, I think, and, and I'm saying this looking back and, and, and trying to look from the, the outside in. I should say I'm not claiming all of these characteristics for, for myself, but I think a degree, a healthy degree of, of empathy and understanding of people's experiences in, in, in their own lives, an ability to put yourself in other people's shoes, mm. an ability to communicate difficult things to people um, and, and do that in a way, as I said there, that, that doesn't try to oversimplify everything all the time. All politicians do that to, to some extent. And an ability to you know, stand your ground at times, even if you feel everybody's against you. And if you feel what you're doing is right and necessary to, to stand your ground and stand up for what you believe in, but also pull off that really tricky thing, sometimes that you know, is very, very hard to do, not to allow that to become intransigence and just shutting your, your eyes and ears to, to different opinions. So those would be the, the characteristics that I would, and just try to, try to retain a degree of, of being human which is perhaps the hardest bit for some politicians. Um, who have I, I've admired um, you know, many politicians over uh, my, my, my time. In my younger uh, days, I, I was just starting out in politics, I, I suppose when John Smith was leader of the Labour Party and you know, died tragically prematurely. I, I had great admiration for him. Obviously, I've admired politicians in, in my own party in, internationally, you know, often it's the, the ones that don't lead the big, powerful countries. The you know, Prime Minister of Iceland is somebody I've got huge admiration for. Jacinda Ardern from afar, because bringing these sort of qualities... Yeah, there are many I admire for, for many different... Angela Merkel I had and, and have huge admiration for. So, uh, But my final point here, again, based on experience, is as a leader, I think you should always try to avoid modelling yourself too much on somebody else you've, you've always got to find because without that you're not going to have this sort of authenticity that is important you've got to find a way of being yourself and that can take quite a while to to crack we'll take one more question in the room and then we'll have to bring things to a close and we'll come down uh here if that's okay Thank you. In your speech, you alluded to uh, the big challenges, or you centred on them. Uh, when you've stepped back from politics, had a break, and had some time to think, do you uh, see yourself in taking a role in some of those non-political but very big challenges? I, I hope so. I, I d genuinely don't know exactly what that role would be. I have no fixed plans or... Um, firm intentions there, but I, I know the issues that I care about, and they're very much reflected in, in that speech. Climate justice, equality, women's rights and, and women's uh, equality, young people, particularly I have, during my years as First Minister, uh, championed the rights uh, and the interests of young people in care and leaving care. So these are the issues I care about, and I hope to find the best way, as you say, once I've had a chance to decompress and clear my head a little bit to, to find the best way of making the most effective contribution on these issues. I, I'm not leaving politics straight away. I'm, I'm staying in Parliament for the foreseeable future, so um, that will also give me the ability to find the best way of, of making a contribution. So, I don't know. Watch the space. Who knows? <laughs> um, we're into overtime, so uh, it remains just for me to uh, thank everyone for coming along, both in the room, uh, in the house, uh, and 
uh, online. Uh, and for all your questions, fantastic questions, I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them. Um, there's plenty in the chat if you want to find out more about uh, RSA Fellowship. Join Adam Smith uh, and become an RSA uh, Fellow. Uh, and indeed, if you are a Fellow, you can con continue the conversation off the back of today's speech uh, on our new uh, Circle uh, platform. So thank you, everyone in the room. But in particular, I want you to extend uh, both best wishes thank to the future, whatever it might hold. We wait with bated breath for Nicola to find out. And join me uh, in thanking uh, Nicola Sturgeon for a fantastic speech. Thank you.